Hello and welcome back to the RFN podcast. After almost an entire year, we've finally got another win in the Champions League group stages as Krasnodar defeated Ren at home on Wednesday evening. However, elsewhere, Loco lost against Red Bull Salzburg and were effectively eliminated, while Zenit were trounced by Club Bruges. The RPL also hots up this week with the three sides now all level at the top. Ufa pulled themselves some obscurity with a brilliant 4 0 win over Tambov. Ahmed Musa has been rumoured to return. And, sis, and, and one of the weirdest penalties ever happened down in the Finna L. Lastly, we'll then explore the potential resignation of Loco CEO Vasily Kiknadze and what that could mean going forwards. To do so, is, as usual, David Sanson. Evening, James. Evening, everyone. And Richard Pike. Good evening, everybody. How are we all? Yeah, I'm good, mate. We're back to a usual programming this week and the kick straight off again with what's uh, finally a bit of a mixed bag instead of just thoroughly depressing <laughs> UCL <laughs> midweek. Now, Lokomotiv started off from a Russian perspective and they are unfortunately all but eliminated now. Of course, the can still finish third ahead of Red Bull Salzburg on the last match day, but to do so, they have to defeat Champions League winning best team in the world behind Munich away from home to get anything and not finish fourth. So, what were your general thoughts on the game, David? Well, it was a shame, really, that they sort of saved their worst performance of the group stage for the the match that they needed it the most. You know, it was it was nothing like uh, the games against Atleti, where they obviously drew both, or, or the Bayern game where they, they came close to drawing. It was, I think, uh, Salzburg, well, for me, Salzburg weren't as uh, or didn't control as much of the ball, although I know that we were discussing this and other people said, oh, no, you know, they had much more of the ball here than Atleti. Um, it seemed like Loco, for me, were given a bit more of the ball in this match, and therefore their plan from the previous matches wasn't really there to be implemented. Um, but it, it was just again <laughs> I feel like we, we have broken records but it was just back down to errors again you know that a uh, couple of the goals uh, were down to defensive errors from, from Rajkovic and even we really made a mistake for the, for the final goal which was a rarity considering how good he's been throughout the group stages um, you know Pen- penalty out of nowhere gave, gave him some hope but ultimately, it was it was just lacking. Uh, but you know, I'll, I'll give them a break because you know they started the game without any real midfielders. You know, as we discussed, the lineup had arguably five centre halves and two fullbacks in it, uh, with Makayev and Murillo, who have played at defensive mid, playing obviously in defensive mid. And at halftime, they brought on three midfielders: Moranchuk. Um, who else came on? Ranchuk and two others came on at half time in midfield. Oh, Mukin, the youngster who had actually had a very good cameo, and uh, someone else. And, and then immediately they looked so much better in the second half, thanks to those changes. And just thought, you know, would they have been good enough? Could they risk starting them? Obviously, Moranchuk was rumored to have had the flu and things like that. Um, but it made a difference immediately, but it was almost too late. You know, if, if they'd played with that sort of mindset and mentality in the first half you, you fancy they probably could have kept the kept the game uh level um but oh, maybe the 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 poor decisions to to line up like that uh, cost them uh, and they struggled to get back from from where they went in the first half yeah that lineup really it was really boring to see like you said there was Five by trade central defenders lined up because of Krakowiak and Kulikov unavailability, and it was really the the first half that that did it for for Loco and for Nikolic. Those, those changes he did make did bring a little bit of life into Loco, and I was quite impressed by Mukin on his on his full debut. I thought he had a really solid game, but 
it's it was just z- like, uh, it, it's actually been very difficult to uh, analyze Loco's attacking intent in the first half and what the game plan was in the first half because there was just none whatsoever. Uh, Red Bull Salzburg we discussed before the first time they played before the first game of this group stage is actually just how how good they are and some of their positional attacks and the progression of the ball from through the channels up to the strike force how good that is and we're really taken aback by quite how quite poor Red Bull Salzburg were, were and especially at home um, that was like not the case whatsoever here Salzburg really forced Loco back even further than there would have been anyway with the with the lineup. And uh Subshalai, Moepu and Barisha I thought really took advantage of Loco's issues, particularly in midfield. Um Madkeev is um, he's been playing midfield, but he's really a centre back by trade. And Marilo, we all know Marilo. Um and the big problems that we we think that maybe playing these guys there could could help the defence a little bit, be a little bit more, bit more steely resolve in the middle. But all it did really was just expose the fact that these two playing central midfield really aren't central midfielders. Um, Sobshalai just kept coming deep for the ball, and there was absolutely nobody from local tracking him. At one point, I, I seen on one on one of our friend sites, uh, Regista, which I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in the pod. Um, they've got a, a really good analysis of the game, and, and the, one of the the gr- the images that they have is of one of the screenshots of the game, and, and there's just a triangle of about thirty yards of Subshalai in between the two lines for Loco and of Loco, and there's not a single player in green anywhere near him. Um, so it just <laughs> that speaks volumes about how Loco approached the game. Really, I feel sorry for them with the injuries they had, but I think it was a bit of a mistake from Nikolic, and it was really disappointing to see him not have a little bit more faith in some of the younger lads and midfielders that could have stepped in like he did show himself in Kulikov who was who's been quite a revelation actually he's been better than Magkaev anyway um Richard do you think that this was the wrong approach from Nikolic was it too defensive maybe or is it just a case if he, he put out what he could difficult one isn't it to analyze because obviously you know it's <laughs> When when news of that those two absentees in uh, Krikoviak and um, and Kulikov broke, obviously you know you you saw the your heart sort of sank really in a way because then it's like oh we well, have to play players out of position now and something that worked so well before for them in the games against Atleti then has to be compromised and like you know it's hard enough playing football in your own position and then when you're having to play in another position it, it just becomes even more difficult. It's a difficult one as well because let's say you know Mukin obviously when he came on he did well but you know had he put put him in there and looked out of his depth you know he then got questioned that way. It was it was yeah it was when those two players in midfield were confirmed as being absent. You know already in addition to Dimmer Barinoff being out till the new year with an ACL injury early on in the season it just really weakens the midfield and then you're having to you know put square pegs in round holes and. And against a side like Salzburg, I mean, I know even though they didn't play particularly well in the first, they didn't play brilliantly in the first game against Loco at home, you know, we still know they're a quality side. We still know the way they pass and move the ball is really good. Um, so I feared for Loco at that moment in time. And I think Salzburg just stepped it up. Um, and when they, well, I think when the second goal went, I think that was the end of the game. I think if Loco got, could have got to 1 0 at half time, they'd have, you know, still had a, a decent chance. But. I think 2-0 was always going to be too much of a task. I mean, I know they got that penalty back, but yeah, it was always going to be difficult after that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is a situation where we have mentioned at times after the Chelsea Krasadar match, after uh, Zenit Dortmund, local Bayern, where you sometimes come against come up against sides who simply outclass you in the night. And I think Jesse Marsh simply outclassed Nikolic. Uh, his his shift to a diamond formation, which Red Bull Salzburg really don't play very often whatsoever, was just an absolute genius move. He learned exactly from the first time the two teams played of how to hit local hard. And that is drag them out, get them in between the lines. They're the only team to do that so far. And this is including a list of Atleti twice and Bayern once. Um, and then when Nikolic changed it and local got a bit of a foothold by... Was he went fought the back, didn't he? P- uh, putting Murillo next to Chuluka and bring off both lights of and Rykovic. Uh, Marsh then switched to a four four two, and had another step to 
to really take advantage of Nikolic. And we have praised Nikolic in the past for, for, the, for his Champions League tactics and for the Christmas tree formation against Bayern. Nobody seen happening and it was perfect. But this time he really did just get outclassed on the night. And I think that just does happen. It's football. You don't necessarily lose all games from your own point of view. Sometimes the opposition are better. Uh, but on the other hand, though, sometimes you are better than the opposition. And to move on, Krasnodar are through to the Europa League or will drop into the Europa League knockout stages in third place ahead of Wren. Now, Wren can still get equal the same amount of points as Krasnodar, but because of the head-to-head record, of course, that means Krasnodar will finish ahead no matter what. Now, David, do you think that this could fare better for Krasnodar from a competitivity point of view? Would they have a better chance of going far in the Europa League? And do they only really miss out from the financial boon that they would get? Um, I mean, obviously, Krasnodar had their chances uh, to not <laughs> finish in this position. They, you know, they they dropped two points. Uh, well, no, they uh, they lost the point last week against Sevilla, which would have kept the group tight. Obviously, the time before that against Sevilla, they they dropped a, a two goal lead to lose. So, you know, they 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 made it competitive given their uh, poor situation. You know, you might argue that arguably you'd fancy them or would prefer them to drop out of Europe entirely because of how badly they need to rectify their league form in the spring. Uh, you know, having to bring the Europa League back in, even if it is just going to be, you know, we're assuming maybe that they're going to go out in this round, depending on the tie, uh, an extra couple of games. But ultimately it's, you know, they're going to play 10 league games in the spring. So an extra couple of European games, I think, isn't too bad. Um, Money-wise, you know, let's be honest, we we don't think Cressner need the money. They've got a billionaire owner. For them, it's all about just doing the best they can, growing themselves as a club in Russia and in, U- in Europe. So, um, you know, for, the, for them, just getting as far as possible, staying in Europe for as long as possible, getting the name of Cressner out there, uh, growing their reputation is the most important thing. So they'll be looking for a big draw against a big team and then to go out there and, and do as best they can. Ideally, they did get that then with the, of course, draw with Chelsea. Um, any draw with an English team is, or Premier League team, is naturally going to going to get your get a lot of in, interest into the club and and yeah, I think they're the biggest loss that they will get from not making it in the group out stages is, of course, that further um, sort of in, infamy, really, and, and knowledge about about themselves. But Krasnodar have actually, to, even though only being their first time in the competition proper, they have massively overperformed. Uh, Ren also, it's their first time, and they haven't picked up a single victory. Um, lost against Bayern, lost against... Uh, Bayern. Lost against Chelsea, lost against Sevilla, same as Krasnodar did. But um, Krasnodar have actually picked up before the game 33% of all coefficient points in Europe by by Russian sides, which is quite an incredible statistic, really. Um, but <sighs> Murad Masayev has been in the press this week discussing Krasnodar and, and why he thinks that it's been quite, quite difficult. And T alludes to the the short summer break being one of the reasons why Russian clubs have, and Krasnodar in particular, have uh, suffered lots of injuries, suffered lots of fatigue and underperformed. Richard, what, what do you think about Masayev's comments? Um, they have some um, validity to them, I'd say. Um, I think, you know, the short summer break has, has definitely been an issue. I think not just for the Russian Premier League clubs, but for I think for everybody, really. I mean, you're seeing that in all the leagues around now, aren't you? You're seeing, you know, uh, PSG not dominating in France quite a lot. In Spain, in La Liga, you know, Barca and Real have struggled with a stuttering start. One or two funny results early doors in the Premier League. So I think this is happening all over, really. Um, so it's had an effect on Krasnodar, yes, but I'd also, you know, counter that slightly by saying it's had an impact on everybody. You know, the short summer break, lack of playing friendlies, lack of a pre-season. Um, so, yeah, there's some validity to the, to the, to the comments. Um but yeah, um, just to go on to Krasnodar, I watched uh, the whole of the game and um, I thought they deserved that win. You know, I thought they, they outplayed Ren in the first half. They were the better side. They had more chances. And then, um, you know, 
it's an ironic thing that they scored from a goal, which you know you don't normally associate with Cresta. It was more of a longer punt, but you know Marcus Berg did absolutely brilliantly to get ahead of the, um, you know, to keep up with the Ren defender, muscle him off the ball, and then it was a lovely composed finish into the bottom corner. Um, it was a really good good finish, um, and yeah, I think what it showed you is that Cresta uh, that was probably the first game this season in the cam- in the campaign this season. Sorry, in the in the group this day, this season, where they had their full assortment of first team players fit, apart from Sergei Petrov at, la- at right back, pretty much everybody else there was a first team player, and that's probably the strongest side, with the exception of Petrov. Although Smolnikov is a near enough the same level, really, not much in it. Maybe Petrov slightly better, but you know that is actually you know a stronger side as Cresta can field, and they matched up to Ren, you know, a side who came third in league and last year really well. So, you know, it's, it's going to be one of those what-if moments. If they'd have had that side available for one of the severe games, who knows? They might have won one of those games, taken it to the final day. They might have even beaten Wren in Wren. So, you know, it's it's a bit of it frustrating. But at the same time, I think everyone is just breathing a huge sigh of relief that we've got one club through. And um, I'm going to say, yeah, Krastada, you know, whilst it's some of the things some of the things have been disappointing this season, like the two games against Sevilla, Probably no. You would probably say with everything that's gone on along with the other Russian clubs that probably crashed have been the better performing ones, and and you know if any of all of them were going to make it through, crashed are probably were the ones. So you know the group, you know Ren, not particularly the strongest side in there who they were going to be battling for third place with. So yeah, compared to you know compared to obviously Lokomotiv, which Atletico and Bayern are you know pretty damn good sides. So. And sorry, in Salzburg as well. So, yeah, no, I'm really happy for them. Delighted and uh, hopefully they can get a nice draw. I actually kind of want them to get, um, you know, not one of the big guns in the Europa League round of 32 because they're going to be unseeded. I'd like them to get for another round because, like I say, we need at the RPL, we need all the coefficient points possible because um, we're, we're, we're really short of them at the moment and the league's been dropping big time. So, just, just... I hope they get a decent draw, but uh, whatever happens, uh, I'm thankful for them for getting through um, to the round of 32 and giving us something to cheer on after Christmas. Yeah, certainly. And I, I, I echo that. I think they have performed the best out of them all. Uh, you look at the other sides, Zenit have been abject in every single way possible. Um, Loco have defended very, very well. Like, very well, really don't want to underestimate just how good at times their defence has been, especially against who they've been playing. But Krasnodar have naively and respectfully to them taken the game to Sevilla. They should have won the first match, absolutely. Their individual errors has cost them. Safanov, Kayo making a few errors here or there. But generally, in terms of play, they have outmatched very prestigious opponents throughout this. And it is, of course, their debut at this level. It's all a learning curve. They have been naive. Messiah has been naive. He's admitted as much to to, to saying so. But uh, when Messiah said about this, about the difficult short break, it, it, I think his exact quote was, I found it here, is that you should not start a season without proper preparation and play two games a week off the bat. Now, <laughs> the, the pre-season was 10 days long. It was shorter than everywhere else. Russia started earlier and finished earlier and had less games in their project restart, or however it's cold um, than any other league in Europe. But because of the meteorological conditions in the back end of every single year in Russia, they had to start it six weeks to a month earlier than everywhere else. Uh, It needs to be remembered that, of course, Manchester United and Manchester City got quite far into the Champions League last during the restart of the Champions League and, and had extra time off because of that. Now, if they hadn't, they would have only had about a, a, a three week to a month break. Because they had the extra time off, they had over a month break. These Russian teams had 10 days. There was no room for maneuver and rest due to this forced restart. There was no room for quality additions due to the limit. And they could only add to add people to the squad like Yevgeny Markov and, and uh, Yonov and, and people who, just, let's be frank, are not good enough for the Champions League level. Coupled, coupled with playing more games than anybody else with the with the qualifiers, having more COVID suspensions of matches than anybody else with bigger gaps in between, and having to travel the farthest out of all of the Russian sides, Krasnodar have have the longest journey of away games from to, to and from Krasnodar from London, Seville, 
and mine's blanked on the last team. Um, uh, Brittany, <laughs> for, Brittany for Ren. Brittany, Brittany thank for you, Ren. Ren. And the, so because of that, this is really affecting them the most. All of this added up with the lack of experience in this level, with that, with the lack of, to be fair, Krasadar, genuine star quality at Champions League level, you really just have to hold your hands up and just commend how well they have done in getting their name out there, showing their brand and being themselves while also being the most successful of the, out of the three or four clubs in Europe so far. Richard, what do you think? Yeah, just a couple of things to come in on. Just just one more, couple more quick things on Krasnodar. I've actually been quite encouraged. and I mean, I don't think they're going to finish in the top three of the RPL this year, but I still think fourth place is on, you know, for them. I think they're about eight, nine points off fourth place with still about just under half the season to go. So they can catch that up now. The, 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 whatever happens against Chelsea next week, it's a bit of a free hit. Um, I think they probably will lose away, but it's a bit of a free hit. So they can concentrate on the lead now. It's, it's sorted. They've got European football after Christmas. And then really now try and hopefully keep everyone fit. No more injuries, no more COVID positives. Get a good run of form going, get up the table, get fourth place. And that new your new UEFA Conference League starts next season, your upper Conference League. I think Krasnodar could do quite well in that. Because if you think about it, the hardest sides you're going to face in that are someone like, you know, someone who's going to finish seventh in the Premier League or La Liga, like a, a Leicester or a Granada or seventh in Serie A, like, you know, an Atalanta. And they're not at the same level as a Bayern, a Chelsea, them kind of sides. So, if you think about it, you know, and in the early rounds, they're going to be, I mean, some of the teams ranked 30th and below in Europe, 25th and below in Europe are going to have three teams in it. So, you know, you're going to have the fourth place team from Bulgaria and stuff like that in your group. So that's way lower in level than teams like even Ren. So I think Krasnodar could, with a proper preseason behind them next year, a couple of quality additions in the summer, you know, get a decent run in the conference league if they qualify. It could be a good time for them to, slowly embark on a bit of a rebuild and maybe even in the winter window maybe even look at a few additions you know maybe you know I know Marcus Berg scored that goal but he's out of contract in the summer maybe Krasnodar could even possibly consider you know I, mean, I know the Swedish league starts in March maybe you say to him you know you, you're out of contract in the summer do you, do you want to go back to Sweden and it frees up a foreign spot for them they could probably then look at a top quality striker maybe even one other area of the squad if they could look to improve it you know, we've been talking about possibly moving either Olsen or, or uh, Villainia on in midfield because, you know, Gazinski's getting quite old in that defensive midfield position. Maybe they might need a fresh leg there too. So it'd be quite interesting to, or maybe move Kyo to a defensive midfield role and then try and bring in a centre-half by freeing up a slot by either Olsen or um, Villainia going. So, you know, because those positions they need, maybe even get them done in the jan- January window if they can. So then they've got you know, the rest of this season to adapt and then next season they can get going for the Conference League and be fully integrated, fully adapted. So, so yeah, so, you know, hopefully now they can go on a good run of form end of the season, get Conference League qualification. And let's see um, see what they can do next year and have a good run in that tournament. Yeah, absolutely. And moving on from, you'd mentioned good run of form, moving on to a team who are anything but good run of form. Absolutely shocking. Any... <laughs> <laughs> Lost... 3-0 away from home against Club Bruges this time. Now, that means that the 2020-21 Champions League campaign will go down as Zenit's worst ever in the Champions League. The club's previous worst performance was in 2007 and eight, where they managed five points in third place. Now, they did finish last, last season in 2019-20, but that was with seven points. So not only is this the second time in a row that they finished the bottom of the group, but it also will be finishing bottom of the group with the worst ever record in the Champions League. Um, Hanu on the RFN Twitter put out a poll, uh, and that was asking yourselves uh, how long before Sergei Samak is sacked after this game, during the winter break, or end of season slash no sack. And that was 43% think during the winter break, 33% after this game, of course, it's after the game, he hasn't been. But it just shows that 70% out of the entirety of the votes in RFN, and then if you look on Twitter, it's just any fans blowing up about but the form in Europe, particularly this season, and then the knock-on effect it has in the RPL. Uh, and there's a long thread on the RFN Twitter about discussing whether or not Semak should be sacked. I recommend go have a little long, bit, bit of a long read on it. It's 
once again from Hanu, or, or one of our uh, regular Zenit fans. Um, so, David, we'll move on. What do, what do you think? Is is this loss on Semak? He is under huge pressure. Um, or is it a bigger issue with Zenit than just Semak? I think I think it's more. I think it's a bit of both. Semak, I think, is throughout his time with Zenit. While, while winning the league domestically twice in a row, um, has struggled, as we've seen with a lot of the Russian coaches, um, to to take his club to the next level in Europe. Um, but at the same time, you know the squad squad is not as balanced as it could be. You know, like all the other teams in Russia, as, as you've just been talking about. You know, they, they've all been struggling with little time they had to prepare, injuries, COVID, and so on. You know, Zenit, Zenit have been hit with injuries, not as much as, as Krasnodar were. But, they, they, you know, they've been missing Duba, Asmoon, um, and Malcolm, all for a good period there. Um, but to, to lose home and away against Club Bruges, the team who, you know, when this all started, we, we, we all said that they, those are the... Those are the games where Zenit have to be taken three points if they want to get anywhere. Um, so to run out losers in both, uh, and in such poor fashion in the second game, um, it, it's 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 pretty much embarrassing from the title from the title winners. You know, the team that's meant to be the best side in the country, the team with the biggest budget in the country. Um, you know it's not good, and uh, you know as you as you were saying, I, I was I was going to fully agree with you. You know, uh, Krasnodar and Lokomotiv both were far more competitive in their groups, um, with worse squads uh, and bigger problems in terms of injuries um, than Zenit were with, you know, a couple of injuries and a better squad and more money. Uh, you know, Krasnodar for, for the for a, at least three of their games started a number of players who. From their academy, who have you know made just a handful of appearances ever, and and they've still come out of the group in third place with a win, uh, and kept it very close against Sevilla home and away. Is there, is there any you know their best result is a draw against Lazio, uh, and they really should have won that. You know the, the fact that they lost that was or that they conceded late on there was, you know another another strike against them so I think it's I think it's both I think it's both you know Simak is you know as, as good as Simak is you know, he knows how to manage in Russia we, there's no doubt about that we, we've seen him succeed with Ufra and now we've seen him win the, the league and the cup with, with Zeni but he's he's really struggled to, to to implement a style in Europe that's going to make a competitive Zenit side play well against bigger teams you know we see them run out against big teams in Russia. You know, they beat Krasnodar, but Krasnodar always try and play their style against Zeni, and it lets Zeni just run right on the counter. Um, teams in Europe aren't going to be doing that. They're, they're going to be playing their best, uh, and Zeni just couldn't match them. Yeah, yeah, certainly. It's a uh... It's quite difficult to unpack, and Semak after the game has also been under a little bit of fire for his own comments, just up Masayev. And Semak himself has met, has said that uh, the depth of the squad was not enough. A lot of Russian football observers and and fans of Russian football teams who are not Zenit have attacked Semak for this particularly, in saying that he's got just the the goal of him to say that the. The, the arrogance of him to say that when you look at Zenit and the money that's behind them and the size of the club and basically getting players for free and so on. Um, personally, I don't agree. I think relative to the fact that Zenit are a title-winning team for the last two years, in pot one of the Champions League groups, they have the easiest opponents, remember. The depth is absolutely shocking relative to that fact. You compare every other winner in every other league in, in Champions League competition, every other pot one team, and just compare the two squads. Yes, yeah, Zenit have a hell of a lot of depth for the RPL, but when you look at the Champions League squad, they might as well be called Apoel Nicosia. 
It's genuinely terrible compared to all of the others at pot one sides. Uh, after Lovren and Rakitsky at centre back, there's either kids in Prokin or Shamkin or Santos being played out of position. There is no backup right back or any backup strikers whatsoever. It's a it's a mess. It's partly their own fault. It didn't buy who they needed. They haven't blooded youngsters and they haven't taken their academy seriously enough in recent years. But this season's just showed how bad the RPL has run. The three main players are out. The Zenit's three main players, that is. And the true issues of the foreign element really comes into keen focus. The usual structural issues, which are in part unsolvable, come back into focus again. The meteorological conditions, which are absolutely unsolvable. It's like shouting at God for the rain. And then, But then there's other things coupled with that. The lack of privatisation, the poor nationwide academy structures, but above all else, inefficient and clueless decision-making at the very top. The entire country, our football side of things, the entire football community in the country is still ran within a Soviet apparatus, despite the fact the Soviet system died off 20 years ago. They haven't replaced it. They've restarted. The restart... It's just absolute ludicrous. They, they have... That mentality, I mean, the behind the scenes, it still works within the Soviet structure. They, they Mentally, they still don't believe in, a lot of teams still don't believe in making a profit. They haven't replaced this school structure that they had in Soviet with proper academies, apart from the odd one here or there of private investment. Middle level apparatchiks run everything really badly, while the top have, level have such ridiculous security of tenure that makes Stalin look like he didn't last very long. The radicals are either pushed out or ignored. It's just ridiculous it's not just on zenit it's not just a case of zenit having all the money and everyone being everyone else being annoyed at them it's above them i i, I do agree that I, th- I think zenit themselves have caused more issues with sometimes semex tactics were wrong zubas too old jerkovs too old they haven't adequately replaced them they haven't bought who they needed in the summer but they didn't do any of that because of the limits that are artificially placed upon them from above that are just absolutely ridiculous and draconian and no longer needed why does this foreigner limit exist it's ridiculous. You see that Turkey brought in a 14-man one and England are about to bring in a points-based system. Their football is only going to go downhill just like Russia's has done under the entirety of the foreign limit ruling. Zenith squad isn't good enough because they are artificially not allowed to go out there and compete. Krasnodar's squad last night had eight foreigners and three Russians in it. Wren had nine Frenchmen and two, Rus- two, two foreigners. Guess who won? I'm not saying that everybody from playing from one country is a bad thing but when you bring foreign football into your country it do, it is a stated fact that it just makes the whole entire level of the league stronger and since we've had the foreigner limit the european performances have been plummeting international performances by spanaya have been plummeting the overall quality of the league in general has been plummeting to the fact that now the coefficients russia's currently still sits seventh but if you look at the latest coefficient tables, Russia could actually drop down to anywhere between 12th to 14th in the in the latest coefficients that have been updated. It's just an absolute disaster. Uh, anyway, David, David, what what do you think? Do you think that Russia are in massive danger for, of their coefficients being dropped to such an extent that their league? The amount of teams they have in in these Europa League and Champions League drops down. Yeah, I mean it's not good. Obviously, the last two two years, uh, Russia getting four points total compared to previous years where, where they've been getting seven, eight, nine as a minimum. Uh, you know, it, it's gonna that those those good years are soon to be dropped out and replaced by these bad years. It's gonna drop them down big time. They needed to be more consistent, and they've. Unfortunately, last year and this season have had very poor results. Um, you know, I, I agree with you fully about the limit. You know, Zenit don't have a deep squad, uh, but the limit doesn't allow them to. You know, they can only do so much outside of their eight foreigners. They they have to make sure that, A, the eight foreigners they've got are as good as they can be. And obviously, the Russia of the league is only going to attract, you know, so many good players. You know, Mal- getting Malcolm was a coup, um, and he's obviously talented. But they haven't yet got the best out of him. Uh, some of the other foreigners, you you would say, are very good. You know, Barrios, Douglas, they're very good. Lovren and Rikitsky are decent. Uh, you know, in the Champions League, you'd, you'd expect them to be a decent foreign centre pairing, but they could be better. Um, but 
that's it. That's just it. You know, they, they've got, they filled those eight foreign spots. And then after that, they have to rely on whatever Russians they can get to be backups or to, you know, they have to have three Russian starters. No matter what, they're going to, they're going to have a minimum of three Russian starters in that squad. Obviously, Zub is always going to be one, but only for the next couple of years until he's too old. Who's who's going to be in there in the future? Kurzhikov's been in there as the goalkeeper. He's not really great. There are other better goalkeepers in Russia of Russian nationality. There are plenty of better foreign national national goalkeepers around. Um, you know, the limit has has really hampered Zenit as the top club in Russia from being able to take it to the next level. Um, you know, based on how quick football business goes, you know, to to impend a new limit on on them with eight foreigners, which is wild to think that, assumingly, all the clubs must have voted for this limit. Um, to impose it on them with, with a, then a short summer break, uh, which allowed them very little time to do much about it. Uh, you know, they had to basically just stick with what they had. Uh, you know, we, we see, we, you know, we're getting glances more into world football as to what goes on behind the scenes. And with someone like Rivalta in there, you know that, Zenit will be planning transfer. Win- They'll be planning for next summer already, planning what foreigners they need. Uh, but obviously, if the, if the limits to change again, or they'll be presumably hoping for a, a change in the limit, which we, I think we're all hoping for, even if it's just to relax it a little bit, you know, bumping it up to you know twelve foreigners or something like that, would just give the clubs a little bit more leeway, just to allow Zenit to at least try and do something in Europe that's not embarrassing. Um, you know, to have a player in there for when Proc- uh, for when Lovren and Rakitsky are injured, uh, who's not Daniela Prokin, 19-year-old, who looks like a 40-year-old accountant. Um, you know, it, it, yeah, yeah, I might as well just stop there because I'll end up just repeating everything you said. You know, we, we all know what the issues are in, in Russia. Um, and unfortunately, the coefficients are going to are gonna cost us. But maybe it'll be good, maybe, you know, growing... From the smaller competitions will work. I think I'm excited to see how the Conference League works for Russian clubs. You know, you'd expect to maybe see Spartak, Siska, Krasnodar, any any of those three clubs could be in that competition next year. Uh, and you'd fancy, especially someone like Spartak, with the squad they've got and the manager they've got, to potentially have a decent go at, at you know getting some wins and getting at least to the to post Christmas in that competition. So um, may, maybe these bad seasons and, and dropping to lower competitions is what the Russian league needs to, to give it a kick up the arse as, as it were. Absolutely. It's not what the league needs to give it a kick up the arse. It's what the people in charge need. They need a rude awakening to realize that what they're continually sweeping things under the carpet and making wrong decisions and bad decisions isn't helping the league in the long run. Whenever you hear a defense of the foreigner limit, they say, ah, but the Bayern team, which defeated Barcelona 8-2 had six Germans in it, which is a majority German. Yeah, it did have six Germans in it. Do you know how many foreigners were in that single Bayern squad at the time? 17? Those 17 foreigners? It just so happened that the majority of the best Germans were all the best players in the in this team. But that's Bayern. That's the exception. It's just it, it's unfathomable why those authorities in charge cannot see that this is continually the thing that limits limits it. Richard, what do you think of the foreign limit? Just quick one. Quick one. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably analyse the whole thing with uh, with Semak, Zenit and the foreign limit. Um, I actually do think possibly Zenit should look to make a change. I mean, you know, I, that, that's my opinion during the winter break. Who they could get, I don't know. I mean, my preference would be, and this is, I mean, whether I'm being a little bit optimistic or not, I don't know. And again, it's purely based on you know Semak's poor performances in Europe. I try and see if Ernesto Valverde is available because obviously Ribalta is a Spanish sporting director, and the crucial thing with um, with Valverde is he's twice he's twice actually coached um, Athletic Bilbao. Now, I mean, if you think the eight foreign limit is restrictive, then um, Bilbao signed Basque only players. Now, you can't get a more restrictive transfer policy than that, and. I think when he's been at Bilbao, Valverde's finished fifth and fourth in La Liga. So, you know, he's obviously got a good pedigree. I think I looked at all his coaching jobs just today and, and Villarreal's the only real place where he's failed. He got Espanyol to a UEFA Cup final. And, you know, and Barcelona got rid of him last year for um, Kike Setien. I mean, and look how that worked out, 8-2 against Bayern. So, you know, um, that's that's who I'd like. I mean, it might be a tad optimistic maybe, but I, I'd... I think all the top jobs in Spain are taken at the minute, and Valverde is only 56. So could Ribalta, you know, 
see if he could persuade him, maybe, you know, and give him the rest of this season after Christmas and see if he can attract, you know, and get the best out of May. He had Malcolm at Barcelona briefly. I mean, he sold him, obviously, but, you know, that's because at Barcelona, Malcolm had to compete with, you know, the likes of, you know, Messi, Griezmann, Usman Dembele for a starting spot. That's not easy. So, but, but yeah, I just want to echo James and David, all, all your thoughts on the foreign limit. And it's just so true. I mean, at the end of the day, I, this archaic limit is just really damaging Russian football. It really, really is. Um, it's They need to just do something about it. I mean, if you are going to have a foreign limit, make it like Turkey's, make it 14 in the squad. And then at least that gives Russian clubs a chance. Like, you know, let's look at it this way. You know, Rakitsky's been a bit off form this year at Zenit. But obviously, because of the foreigner limit, they had to, when Emmanuel Mamama um, finally came back from his injuries, they had to, you know, send him out on loan to Sochi because they were on the foreign limit. Now, if the limit was 12 or 14, I mean, I prefer no limit like you guys. I think the limit should be abolished completely. But if the limit was 12 or 14, at least, you know, Zenit could have kept Mamama in the squad, you know, and then at least, you know, if Rakitsky's having a poor run of form, they can give Mamama a go at centre half. You know, at least then they can, you know, 12 foreign limit, a 12 foreign limit, player foreign limit, gives Zenit the opportunity to have an extra defender, an extra striker and an extra midfield player and one other utility player. You know, that that is a, a godsend when you're packing your squad out. You know, you've got more depth off the bench. And, and yeah, it's, and, and, and one other caveat, I'm going to, one other thing I'm going to throw in as well about the foreign limit, I mean, Daniela Prokin was mentioned there. But it's also harming and damaging Daniela Prokin too, because if you think about it, really what Prokin should be now at 19, he needs to be get, he needs to be playing every single week, and he's sort of in that difficult position right now. He's too good to go back to Zenit too, but he's not really ready to start in the first team for Zenit. But because of the foreigner limit, Zenit can't really accumulate a huge amount of depth all across the squad, so he has to stay there, and he only plays every now and again. So it damages his development. You know, and you know, denies him match match minutes. You know, uh, it's just it's it's really really bad, and, and and worryingly, you know, what's what's concerning. I saw an interview today, and I think it was Champion. I think it was Zenit Two's uh, manager. I've, I've forgotten his name, but he even said, "I think the limit should be put back down to six or words to that extent." And I'm thinking to myself, just really, no, six will be even worse. Right? It's it's really just not good, you know, and. <sighs> The limit should be lifted. It, 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 it surely, I mean, Valery Gazayev, who used to come at CSKA Moscow, you know, CSKA Moscow, he, he mentioned about, you know, the limit should be lifted. And, and I am hopeful. I saw that Sports Are You poll where it said, I think it was about 70% of correspondents of fans interview wanted it lifted. So, I mean, I, I hope now that there is some momentum behind this and we fi- finally might get something during this winter break. And to me, it has to come into effect next season. You know, never mind 2022, 2023, next season, it's got to come in. It's either got to be an abolition of the limit completely, or at least at minimum, put it up to 11 or 12 and give Russian clubs a chance to get a bit more depth in there to help them in Europe. Because, you know, when your foreign players lose form or get injured, you know, (laughs) you you can't just buy more because you've got the limit. Eh, They need to get rid of it. It's just archaic. You know, rant over. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I know how you feel there. In, in typical Russian football fashion, um, those in charge do a bad job of everything, and I have let us overrun quite substantially on our first topic. So I will just quickly run through some RPL quick kicks, and uh, rumours have emerged that potentially Ahmed Musa could be re- re- returning to Siska. Um, that was originally in some Russian press articles that he was all but set to sign. His agent has actually put down that story, saying that it's not accurate information, that he's still also in negotiations with Galatasaray, so perhaps want to keep an eye out on in the future. Um, the list of players who have played every minute of the season thus far is unsurprisingly majority goalkeepers and lots of people who can run a lot. <laughs> Alexander Belenov, uh, Maximenka, Ilya Tratov... Igor Akinfeyev, Mikhail Kurzhakov are all the goalkeepers involved who played every minute of every game, as well as Urals, Denis Kulikov, uh, Spartak's Alex Kral, Lokomotiv's Murillo, Spartak's Roman Zobnin, who probably has got enough energy to run for all of them put together, and Rostov's Miha Melvia. 
And lastly, the nominees for Best Youngster and the RPL for 2021 have also been released. Now, this is, of course, Russian only and is as follows. Uh, Artem Golubev, Roman Yevgenyev, Daniel Glebov, Igor Dveyev, Stanislav Makeyev, Pav Pasha Maslov, Nail Umyarov, Daniel Utkin and Konstantin Maradashvili. Uh, another quick one. Siska are out. <laughs> Just to compound a little bit of misery, we are recording as Siska play, and they are now out of the Europa League. It's uh, totally depressing. <laughs> <laughs> playing Wolfsburger tonight, of course. They lost 1-0 on the night, and it was a brilliant goal that, to be quite honest, they couldn't have done much about. But more longer issues, of course, that we have went through a lot of them. It's more structural issues and, and nationwide issues come for Siska just as much as to do the three teams in the Champions League. Um, they have some quality who are more than good enough but once again it's just not enough throughout the entirety of the team and to move back to Lokomotiv an interesting story has emerged this week and it was originally reported on by Meta Ratings who I don't know about anybody else but they've kind of suddenly over the last two weeks or so popped out as a really weirdly reliable source of news on Russian football but uh, as it became known to them, the management of Lokomotiv have made a decision in principle to resign the general director of the club, Vasily Kiknadze. The functionary will continue to serve until the end of the calendar year, after which he'll most likely be relieved of his duties following the final meeting of the board of directors, which is scheduled for the end of December. Lokomotiv's winter transfer campaign will be overseen by a new CEO. They go on to say that they're already looking for a replacement. And... Then uh, other places have reported, such as Championat, that they have already contacted Shamil Gazizov. Uh, Meta Ratings themselves have also reported that uh, Yoris, Yoris Yomin, former legendary manager and himself actually club president when they won the Russian Cup in 2006-07 season, hasn't ruled himself out of perhaps taking the job. And he has supported the resignation of Kiknadze in the past. Now, this... Kiknadze ordeal has been a long running saga with the Lokomotiv fans. Um, he replaced Ilya Gerkus, the former president and CEO, in 2018. And basically, from the outset, he had a terrible relationship with the fans. The first time he sat down to meet with the fans, it was ultras, it was regular fans, and so on, in a big meeting, um, he insulted them directly to their faces. And since then, has been blamed largely for a lot of the issues that are festering behind the scenes at the club and it really came to a head with the sacking of Siomen. Now a lot of local fans, maybe not some of the older ones and more traditional ones and members of fan groups, have put their support behind Marco Nikolic because at the end of the day it's their team and Nico is their manager but they are not happy with the way Siomen was treated as a club legend. Um, Lokomotiv, it came to a head when the United South fan group, which is an ultras group, um, and they had basically called for a list of 27 complaints after the 5-1 defeat by Dinamo, um, one of which was the immediate departure of Kiknadze and board chairman Anatoly Meshirkov. And then angry chants against Kiknadze have been relevant, uh, prevalent in every single locomotive match since Siomen's departure. So it's it's been one that's really festering behind the scenes for quite some time now. Um, so, David, I'll, I'll come to you first. Do you think that Semen would be a good idea to, to go to Lokomotiv as president and CEO, CEO and not as manager? I mean, I don't really know what he's got to offer, um, to be quite honest. You know, Sion's a, a manager. Uh, you know, his... his, his... His talents were, were, you know, were in his tactical management and, and his man management. You know, at, at that level, in in the modern game, you don't want a seventy-year-old ex-manager as a director slash CEO. You you want someone who's a businessman who's who's familiar with how a football club runs. You know, where, when Loco were leaning towards Stoppel House uh, in the past, you know, they they had their good spell. You know, they brought in. A foreigner who's who's experienced in the game of working in one of those positions. They they signed well, you know. Granted, a lot of them were older players, but they signed good players. Um, 
and they won the league, you know, for the first time in God knows how long. Uh, he then departed, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's just slowly gotten worse for them. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be, it, it just would not be, I, I couldn't imagine why anyone would do it. You know, stick him in a in a position where it's just more sort of talismanic or, you know, he's just there, like, but like the vice president or something of the US, you know. He, he he doesn't really do with anything, but he's there. You know, it would just make everyone feel good if he's part of the club again. Um, but yeah, don't involve him in, in running the club. I, I genuinely think a lot of the clamour for his return is purely, like you said, it is just for his return to get him back. Uh, a lot of fans feel that they owe him something for what they've brought them over the years. Now, he was previously club president, but it was literally just a, uh, a temporary thing like it wasn't uh, long term whatsoever and he has expressed interest but I think Sjoman loves the club that much if anything comes up he will express an interest in because Loco is his team he built a lot of what modern Loco are um, the, but I agree it, it, it just isn't a role that would suit him it's very much a case of basically there's an inherent mistrust among a lot of a lot of clubs, boards, and the advisors within the boards and people in the board room of outsiders. And um, once again, it goes back to that Soviet mentality I mentioned earlier. And we are really seeing that right now at, at Spartak with uh, Shamil Gazizov, of course, former UFA, um, genius and mastermind who took over at Spartak in the summer. Now, he's been in discussions, according to Championat, with local in taking over from Kiknadze. Of course, Kiknadze, it's not been confirmed yet. This is all just hearsay and rumour at this point. Of view, point, But Gazizov basically is, if rumour is to be believed again, set to leave Spartak in the coming months, be- during the winter break at some point, or perhaps even earlier. Uh, this has all come to a head where basically the player of Vanda, um, plays in the French League, was wanted heavily by Fadoon. Fadoon really liked the look of this player and really wanted him at Spartak to, to wear the Spartak colours and to lead them on the pitch. And he, he put his oar in. He, he did what none of us wanted when Gazizov was given the job and didn't give him a room. Gazizov is not a fan of Evander. And this is all rumour anyway. So this is kind of developing story on the Spartak telegrams. And basically Gazizov then... Something bizarre happened where Ufa then suddenly matched Spartak's bid for Evander. And Evander's agent has since confirmed that he was actually in negotiations at one point with both Spartak and Ufa. And weirdly enough, the person representing both clubs was the same man, which never happens. And he said it was very bizarre. And what's developing on these Spartak telegrams is that Kazizov got his people at Ufa to put a bid in, and it was reportedly six or seven million euros. And the aim was to basically create a bidding war in which Fadoon would say, I'm not paying that, and pull out, because Gazizov didn't want him. And Fadoon had went over Gazizov's head to Domenico Tedesco and said, oh, would you like this player? Tedesco okayed it from his point of view. I mean, he's only the head coach. He doesn't make these decisions. He just said, yeah, I would like that player. I just want to discuss with his manager first um, some certain aspects of the game. And Fadoon completely ignored Gazizov, exerted his pressure, went over his head. And then... This comes down to basically Gazizov being an outsider, Fadoon exerting his pressure and not being trusted. So, Richard, do you think that this whole Kiknadze debate is is a bit of a wider problem in the RPL? And do you think maybe Gazizov would do a job at local? Well, it's bad enough, the results on the pitch and the foreign limit at the minute, and now all this. I mean... <laughs> I don't understand Spartak at all. It's just so stupid. You know, the top of the, the top of the league, you know, everything else is chaotically going on around them. The rest of the clubs like Siskans and eat tumbling out of Europe like they've done. They're on set to, they're doing really well because he's off's got like a good set of players there, good young hungry players. He's improving them. You can definitely tell there's been a massive improvement in Spartak. I mean, it's still not fluid yet. I think they're still missing a playmaker, probably not a central defender. And then maybe even a striker long term. But, you know, he's getting there bit by bit. You know, he's fostered a unity amongst the players. They seem to enjoy playing for him. Things are going well on the pitch. And then Spartak just shoot themselves in the foot yet again with all this interference from the background from Fidoon. Uh, reported interference anyway in the background from Fidoon. And it, it's just, it's just a mess, you know. You just got to sometimes, as an owner, there's always that saying, isn't it? Owners are best when they just 
stay in the background, sign the checks, buy the players, buy the manager, buy the coach staff, and just let them get on with the jobs. And it's it's just a complete mess. You know, you brought in Gaziz off. He did a brilliant job with, um, you know, brilliant job with Ufa, you know, for, for, for several years, making them punch well above their weight, finish sixth in the RPL, playing Europe for the first time. You only have to look at what's happened to them since he's left. And, you know, and then all this again, I, I don't understand why Sparta want to do it. Just just let everything else combust around you and then just, you know, go and try and win the title this year. It's definitely on, you know, because Zeni are struggling at the minute, Siska are struggling at the minute. The league in general has been very poor this year. So I, it's just, again, more interference, which is totally uncalled for and, you know, just a total mess. As for Lokomotiv with Gazizov, well, I mean, yeah, if Spartak really are, if the board at Spartak, you know, are foolish enough to move Gazizov on just months after getting him, then, yeah, I think he'd be a great pick for, for Lokomotiv. I think, you know, it's certainly something worth exploring. And, you know, you just wonder, don't you, is this one of those things if it comes off and Lokomotiv do get Gaziz off and they suddenly start getting in the right direction again, Spartak going to have a massive egg on their face. You know, and it's, you know, yeah, I think he'd be quite a decent pick because obviously, you know, you look at how rudderless a ship Ufa have become since Gazizov left them. You know, I think this could be, you know, quite a smart move by Lokomotiv if they got it, if they got Gazizov. So, yeah, um, I'd be, I'd be totally in favour of it. Yeah, if, if the rumours are, are true. I, I like one thing that we we were mentioning this in our RFN chat, and Alexei Shakarov is a Spartak fan, of course, and he mentioned that. Fadoon's basically transfer uh, Fadoon's transfer campaigns if you like or bids are, ba- are either full price full price and fail price and it just sums up Fadoon <laughs> brilliantly and because Ezov's come under a little bit of a little bit of stick for what he's done here and look it, it is a bit dodgy and it is a bit wrong but his he was never trying to pull the wool over Michelin's eyes or Ufa's eyes he was basically forced to create this bizarre scenario to try and navigate around Leonard Fadoon's own personal narcissism and and need for exerting complete control at all times. And that's just Spartak in a nutshell. Like Richard, you said it's crazy. Unfortunately, it's to me, it's not crazy. This is exactly what I was waiting for. It's a very Spartak for things to be going well. It's suddenly just to implode, and 99% of the time it's because of something that Fadoon's done. Richard, what do you think? I mean, maybe he plays football manager in his spare time, and he's you know he's had a game with Spartak, and now all of a sudden you know secretly plays it in his spare time, and you know he thinks, oh, I'm doing well with Spartak on football manager. I've won the Europa League, I've won three Russian Premier League titles in a row. You know, I can do it all on my own and on a computer game. So you know, real life. I totally agree. Yeah. It's just a mess, you know. I, I, why on earth do you just want to interfere all the time and all this? It's just, well, you know, the le- the club's just not going to progress if you carry on doing this. Just you've just got to let these people who you work so hard to get because he's off. Just let him do his job. It's it's just so frustrating. Yeah, it's it's frustrating, but it's for me, unfortunately, exactly what what I expected and. We're now at the, at the end of this week's podcast. So Krasnodar are at least the darlings of the league and thankfully did pick up that one win to secure at least one team in Europe beyond Christmas this season. We'll be back again next week with all the usual content. And keep an eye and your ear out for not one, but two podcasts covering the Russian sides as we take on a pair of Germans in, in the Champions League in, in next, next year. Uh, David, got anything to promote this week? Uh, no, nothing, nothing to promote this week. That's nice, nice, nice and fun. Richard, yep. where can everyone find yourself? You can find me at richdpike89, at richdpike89. And check out Heart of Football in the next few weeks. There'll be some content on there and um, I'm sure you'll really like it. When I'm when I asked Richard everybody about something, uh, when I asked David, sorry, about something to perhaps promote, I was hoping that David would perhaps mention something to do with Football Manager. Yeah, I must admit, as Richard was explaining his, I did suddenly remember. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> sorry, I was like blanking. I just thought, now nah, I've not written anything. But yeah, that is true. Um, if you're a Football Manager player or fan, um, and you 
desire to play in the Russian Premier League for whatever reason. Uh, we'll soon be releasing on on the site and on Steam um, our update file for the Russian for the Russian leagues. So it'll activate the, the PFL and the fourth tier, um, and there's plenty of data updates and fixes that um, where I've looked at the database and said, well, he's not he's not rated high enough, or he's rated too high, or fixed positions, or names, or or various things. It's, it'll just be a nice nice addition to your game. So um, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Yeah, and everyone remember to join in with the RFN Predictions League, which is Andrew Flint's little baby that goes on on the Facebook page. Uh, Andrew has let me know to to send a message that, don't worry, the updates on the Predictions League tables will be out as soon as possible, as soon as he can find his way through the snow in Siberia. Uh, Richard and David, thank you for both joining me. This has been the RFN Podcast. Goodbye for now. Идет футбольный матч, летит над полем мяч. Веди его, беги, точнее его ударь. Но мяч берет на ноги решительный вратарь. Не напрасно футбольное поле самых ловких и смелых плечов. Здесь нужны тренировка и воля, быстрота, увлечение, расчет.